Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. People are still pouring in, but um, it's time to start with the uh, East Asian Australasian Flyway Coastal Webinar, Coastal Showbird Webinar that we're uh, hosting as BirdLife International. Um, I, my role is simply to explain a little bit to you what, the, what we're going to do, what the platform is about just uh, to highlight two things. One is that this, uh, this session is being recorded. So uh, at the end of the webinar, we will be able to share with you the recording. And the other thing is that you can, ans you can ask questions. Uh, if you hear something interesting, you want to know more about it or any of the presentations, you can use the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. You can just go to it. If it doesn't show directly, just move your cursor to the bottom of your screen and you will see Q&A. And that's where you can ask a question. It would be great if you could be specific as saying, oh, that talk about Thailand or that story about black face boombill. Um, I want to have a question about it. That makes it easier for us to moderate it. So behind the scenes, um, myself, Baron van Geemerden and Ding Lee, my colleague at BirdLife International, We'll be moderating all the questions and passing them on to the presenters. Um, so this is a, as a welcome. Um, I now hand over to the first speaker of the day, which is uh, Vina. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, Baron, um, um, sort of set things up and I just want to sort of introduce um, um, today's sort of uh, session and its purposes. Um, it's great to see so many of you, uh, fantastic. Um, World Migratory Bird Day is a day of celebration. But even as, even as we celebrate this, we've got to acknowledge the fact that the migratory birds are a yes. threat. Um, and especially along this flyway, which I regard as the greatest of all the flyways, um, the threat is the greatest. Um, we've seen numbers crashing, we've seen the Spoonbill Sandpiper losing 90% of its numbers. Um, and that suggests that urgent action is necessary um, to address that. Um, but not all is doom and gloom. Um, there is hope. Um, and this webinar is really about that hope. Um, we have put together a series of presentations today that are really about the different success stories um, happening across the flyway. Um, um, many of the organizations working um, and who are presenting today, working on, on conservation and are presenting today are BirdLife partners, but there are many who are collaborators with BirdLife. And um, this is also an opportunity for us to demonstrate that success um, and demonstrate that um, things are possible. And I, I just do want to sort of say that at the end of this webinar, we, we want to sort of hopefully convey three things. Firstly, there is hope. Um, the challenges are immense, land conversion, illegal killing, um, energy infrastructure, coastal infrastructure, coastal pollution, a whole bunch of reasons, a whole bunch of threats stand in the way of success. Uh, but there is hope. Um, there are organizations working out there and, um, and uh, we should sort of get, get behind them and rally behind them um, to sort of successfully conserve uh, the flyway and the magnificent birds that um, use the flyway. 
but secondly, there is also a message of innovation. Um, solutions um, to, to huge problems require innovation, require thinking out of the box, uh, require sort of uh, thinking in a way that is slightly different um, to how we normally think when it comes to problem solving. Um, and I think you will see today that the organizations working at different levels, at the local level, working, working to sort of engage with politicians, um, working on conservation action, working, at, working with international policy processes, organizations are taking, are using innovative approaches and creative approaches to sort of um, uh, resolve these issues. And where there is innovation and where there is um, creativity, um, I think that can be success. But the third, the third point that I want to make is about local action. So working locally means that we take advantage of two things. We take advantage of local knowledge, uh, but we also take advantage of local passion. Um, and when we have local knowledge and we have local passion, um, it becomes, it's a huge, it's a huge boost um, to conservation. And that, that is a message that I also hope um, that we can convey today. And I hope that we can all then get behind local organizations working um, towards uh, the conservation of um, this flyway. Um, I just would like to sort of conclude by um, acknowledging the different organizations that have come together today to put, to put, this, put, this, um, uh, put together this webinar. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for the fantastic conservation work that you do on the ground. Um, uh, we would be nowhere without you. So you are the front line and we forward to you to get behind you. Um, and I also want to take, take this opportunity um, to thank uh, the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. Um, it's, it's an absolute privilege to have you sort of sharing, sharing this platform with us. Uh, we, have, we are members of the Flyway Partnership, of course, but, but, but more importantly, you have been um, the work that you have been doing has been an inspiration for us, and uh, it's been a real privilege to be working with you. Uh, thank you for that support, and uh, we look forward to working with you going forward. Um, finally, I would like to thank uh, my two colleagues, uh, Baron and Ding Lee. Um, I know it's been hard work, um, but you, you guys have done a great job, and um, um, this, is, this is your success together with the, the people that... Um, make up this webinar. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I will hand this back to you, uh, Aaron. Thank you for the welcoming words, Vinna. That was great. Yeah, I should have probably said that I'm Baron van Gemeren and I'm the, uh, the coordinator of BirdLife's Global Flyways Program. So together with Ding Lee from the end of the BirdLife Secretariat, we coordinate the work on uh, migratory birds. Uh, probably know Ding Lee much better. Um, okay, now moving on to the next presentation, if you welcoming word from Doug Watkins from the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. Over to you, Doug. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, um, I work with the Secretariat for the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. We are very pleased to, um, to be here and, and have this uh, webinar led by, by BirdLife. Um, our partnership is a voluntary partnership with 39 governments, um, sorry, 18 governments, six uh, intergovernmental organizations, which are the conventions, 13 um, NGOs working internationally, uh, one IGO um, and one corporate. Um, what the NGOs bring to the partnership is, is the enthusiasm, um, and also they bring a lot of the, the baseline information, um, the, the counting of, of birds um, and information about the sites that the birds use. So the NGO involvement in this partnership is fantastic. Um, and this is a rather unique mechanism where NGO representatives and government representatives can sit at the same table and discuss issues as equals. Um, and this mechanism is working very well. And now the partnership has a network of 147 sites across the flyway uh, for the conservation of our migratory water birds. But we've still got a long way to go because there's more than a thousand internationally important sites uh, across the flyway. So much more to do and NGOs and, and individual bird watchers can really uh, contribute to this conservation effort by building knowledge about the sites. So um, please do, uh, 
join the full seminar. There's lots of, uh, lots of very interesting talks today. Um, and thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Doug. That's great. So now we're getting to the heart of the, uh, the talks. The next presentation is by uh, Siam. Uh, he's from the Spoonbilt Sandpiper Task Force from the same uh, East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership as, uh, as Doug. And uh, he will tell us all about this beautiful, um, yeah, probably the most enigmatic flagship shorebird you have in the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And I'm really happy to have seen it in Bangkok uh, last year. So Yam is giving, uh, he is here in, in, in person. So he's able to ask questions at the end of the thing, but because the internet connection is not so good, um, he has made a pre-recorded uh, presentation. But do please ask questions. Uh, Siam is there to answer. Hello, um, thank you for inviting me um, to talk about shorebird conservation and the problems they're facing and what we're doing uh, to solve those in South Asia. Uh, now my name is Siam Chaudhry and I work as an assistant coordinator of the Spoonbill Sandpiper Task Force. And today I'll talk about what we are doing um, in Bangladesh on Spoonbill Sandpiper and their conservation. So the Spoonbill Sandpiper is one of the most certain birds in the world. And it's, uh, it's a very small bird, as small as a high sparrow, but it's more threatened than the tiger with a global population of probably less than uh, 200 billion pairs. So it breeds in, in Far East Russia and travels down to Bangladesh and Myanmar through Korea and, um, and China and Japan uh, to its main wintering grounds in Bangladesh and Myanmar. And when they're traveling, they face a wide variety of problems, um, uh, intertidal habitat loss and degradation um, of those habitats is one of the key issues that we have faced, um, especially in the stopover sites. So you can see that um, in, in South Korea, in Suningam, um, there was an excellent site that used to uh, be a very important stopover site for the Sumungam sandpipers, but that area is now being reclaimed and it's entirely gone. One of the other problems that the uh, spoonbill sandpipers and many other shorebirds face is hunting, uh, especially in Bangladesh and Myanmar. And we believe that uh, caused one of the major problems for spoonbill sandpipers. Um, so you might wonder why do they travel all the way from Russia to Bangladesh to spend their winter? The photograph, the map uh, to the left is the answer to a question uh, because uh, Bangladesh um, has the uh, one of the most largest um, delta in the world, that's Ganges Delta, which receives huge amount of sediments every year from, from the Himalayas. And that provides excellent habitat for Spoonbill and Pagar, where they can find food, what they like, and spend their winter. So before we started working in Bangladesh in 2009, um, there was a big number of uh, wintering birds, um, you know, in early 80s. Um, and we still hold the largest single count uh, record, which is 202 individuals in 1989 from Bangladesh. Uh, we, we still hold that record. And after that, as you can see in the table, the numbers were inconsistent. Um, and uh, in 2009, when I decided to do my undergrad thesis, um, I was wondering if I should take this challenge to try and find if there are more spoonbill sandpipers in Bangladesh and if there are new sites to be discovered or conservation problems to be revealed. So in 2009, I received a small grant from the Explorers Club in order to carry out uh, surveys throughout uh, the Bangladesh coast. And we had identified Shunadi Island as one of the main wintering sites and uh, the Marcher, which is uh, part of Nijum Deep National Park, uh, is also a stopover site. So while we were doing surveys on Shonadi Island, uh, monthly surveys, uh, we encountered hunters. Uh, we found that the local people, some of the uh, local community members were hunting shorebirds using noose traps uh, and sometimes mist nets. Um, and we had to do something to solve that problem. And we really needed to know um, you know, who are these hunters and what kind of methods they're using and uh, if they're doing it regular basis or, you know, only in winter and if they're professional and things like that. So 
we took some time to really um, work with the local community, understand uh, their culture values and really understand if, if um, our intervention uh, would actually solve this problem. So we identified a total of 53 hunters and um, 30 of them were professional hunters who, um, who were um, using um, money um, through shorebird hunting, um, especially in winter months. Uh, and then some of them actually claimed um, that they had captured uh, spoonbill sandpipers, uh, um, in, uh, 22 spoonbill sandpipers uh, in, in just one season. We don't really know if they actually had captured those birds, but if, even if they did a few birds, um, then that uh, is a big problem that we needed to solve. Um, and then we uh, started our interventions. It took us some time, uh, at least uh, an entire year, to really find um, the, uh, the alternative livelihood support they would want. Um, so they, these are the uh, options they picked on their own. We didn't give them any money. We bought them these uh, things like fishing boat. Um, some of them took livestock. Um, some, of, some people were interested in, in you know, tailoring shop and things like that. So the agreement was that they will obviously stop hunting. Uh, at the same time, they will protect the sites. Um, they will, they have to go to these sites anyway for, for their um, you know, livelihood activities. Um, so they will protect the site if someone comes from the outside and try and hunt those birds. Um, and they would return a small percentage of their monthly income um, to the village conservation group. And that money will be later used for conservation campaign. Um, I will talk about uh, that in detail some other time, but here is, here is a very brief um, explanation of what we did. So not only that, we were uh, largely engaged with the local community through uh, outreach and education events uh, involving women, um, which is very important. And we, we did all of that in, in um, in collaboration with the forest department and other local government agencies. Um, so by doing these events, the local communities knew that knew all of the hunters and there was no way for the hunters to go back to the villages and try and sell birds. We also um, did uh, a boat race um, and that was, that was um, really uh, liked by the local people and I think almost 5,000 uh, local community members that participated in this huge event, which I think played a key role in raising our profile, or our species profile in on Shanahi Island. We also work closely with the forest department. Here you can see the honorable uh, chief conservator forest who um, was in this event that took place on Shanahi Island. And they very kindly invited me to deliver a keynote speech. So, you know, what is the impact um, of all these interventions um, that we did and what is the science behind it? Um, so we, we have been doing uh, regular surveys uh, on Trinidad Island since 2009. So it's been almost 11 years that we have been doing it. And we can see um, an increase in shorebird numbers, especially in terms of smaller birds. Um, that indicates that our interventions uh, somehow worked and um, and there is no more hunting in the area. Um, one of the other things that we have been uh, focusing on is, is, uh, is communicating with a wide variety of um, uh, stakeholders, um, target audiences. We have, we have published uh, six peer-reviewed papers on, Shana, on shorebirds of Shanadi Island and many other um, decided to build a deep sea port uh, on Trinidad Island. And recently they have formally and finally uh, declared that they'll, they'll no longer build this port, which was probably a political decision. Uh, but we were very delighted to see that the, the, the government highlighted the importance of biodiversity of Trinidad Island and especially birds. And we think all our um, campaign and uh, papers and uh, other activities had played a tiny role there. Um, 
So we also do regular expeditions um, in different parts of, of the entire Delta. Uh, we did this model to, to find new and uh, new shorebird sites uh, in, in Bangladesh coast. And we discovered a new site in 2015 and 16 with 48 spoonbills and vipers um, in a new island that nobody really knew about it before. And uh, we put forward a, uh, an application uh, to designate the site as a flyway network site through the forest department. And the forest department um, uh, provide, uh, you know, submitted that uh, to the flyway partnership and it was declared at the, as a flyway network site in 2018. So if I zoom out and give you an overall picture of the Spoonbush and Piper sites in Bangladesh, uh, the Shunadi Island is legally protected as an ecological critical area and now currently being considered as a, as a uh, marine uh, reserve as well. Uh, we have uh, solved the problem of hunting. At least 95% of the hunting has been mitigated. We have done a follow-up um, survey in 2016 to see if the hunters are going back to hunting or not. We found that most of, almost all of them are, are um, quite happy with their uh, current livelihood um, occupations. Uh, some of them actually left Bangladesh and went to another country. Um, and uh, the new site is now a flyway network site and hope that it will be uh, a nationally protected area soon. And another site is the Nijum Deep, uh, which, is not, which is already a national park and recently it was discovered as a marine reserve. Thank you very much. Um, that's it. Thank you, Sayam. Excellent talk. And um, I see people clapping. A few great questions have already come in. Um, so do keep them coming, uh, everyone. Use the Q&A function to ask questions to Sayam. He is here uh, with us today. Um, now moving on to the next presenter, that is Millie Formby. She's from BirdLife Australia. She is the founder of Wing Threads Initiative, which is an exciting new way to uh, engage new audiences for migratory shorebirds conservation. And she, she does some daring things, which she will now talk about. Over to you, Meli. Thank you, uh, Baron and uh, Ding Lee and the BirdLife International and the EAAP as well for asking me to speak this evening. Um, my name is Millie Formby. I'm co-author and illustrator of the non-fiction children's book, Shorebirds Are Awesome. And I'm also a zoologist and a pilot. And I'm speaking to you today about engaging new audiences with migratory shorebirds through storytelling and adventure. So environmental messaging often uses doom and gloom stories to motivate us to act. But how are we supposed to stay engaged with difficult issues long term without feeling hopeless and burnt out? That question led me to create wing threads. I love birds, especially migratory shorebirds. These creatures call many places home as they travel up to 25,000 kilometres on migration from Australia to Siberia and back again every year. They're also the most endangered birds in the world because of habitat loss, hunting, climate change and other human activities at key stopover sites along their migration path known as the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Back in 2016, I was struck by an idea to follow our shorebirds on migration from Australia to Siberia. What if I could inspire people by doing the very thing shorebirds excel at, flying? At the time, I'd never even flown a plane before. So I learned to fly a microlight. I've now been a recreational pilot for four years and thanks to sponsors and many generous donors, even have my own microlight, which you're seeing on the screen right now. And I was fortunate enough to even help build the microlight myself with the manufacturers in Newcastle, New South Wales on the east coast of Australia. When I first decided to pursue wing threads, I didn't have a clear why for what I wanted to do. From my experience volunteering in shorebird conservation, I could see that people sometimes had difficulty spreading the word about shorebirds to an audience that weren't already engaged with birds. And I could see that a female pilot flying a microlight following the migration route of a group of birds would likely create a spectacle that could bring a lot of attention to the issues facing shorebirds. Since then, I have brought my experience in e-learning and illustration to the project and Wing Threads has grown to become an online source of creative STEM resources, using shorebirds to educate mid-primary students about ecosystems. 
Thanks to CSIRO Publishing in Australia, I was offered the opportunity to create a non-fiction children's book, which is called Shorebirds Are Awesome. It's written by acclaimed Australian children's book author, Jackie Curran, and it's being illustrated by myself, and it's due to be published in 2021. In writing Shorebirds Are Awesome, myself and Jackie made a conscious decision to move away from the typical doom and gloom approach to conservation messaging, that's often based on the Kaufman drama tri triangle, that places shorebirds as victims, highlights the fact that they're in decline, and blames industry and other human activities as the perpetrator to encourage the reader to become a rescuer and save the day. We saw this approach as contributing to feelings of anxiety, hopelessness, and a sense that we're running out of time that can impede creative problem solving. So instead, we chose to provide an entry point for the issue of shorebirds by starting with telling them how they're completely awesome. So Shorebirds Are Awesome takes the reader on a journey with me in my microlight, where they learn about shorebirds' amazing migrations, the importance of wetlands, and how and why we should protect them. Using the marvel of shorebird migration, Shorebirds Are Awesome illustrates how local wetland ecosystems are not isolated, but have a place within a global context and introduces people to the ecosystem services wetlands provide to convey the message that protecting wetland habitats is not just for the birds, but for us too, because we rely on the same ecosystems for our health and well-being. In addition to Shorebirds Are Awesome, I've created a series of online shorebird profiles called Meet the Shorebirds, such as the Terex Sandpiper here, that provide educators with more specific information on each shorebird species in language that is fun and easily accessible for mid-primary students. These are available for free on the Wing Threads website. I'm also in the process of creating a series of online lesson plans, including e-learning videos and illustrated classroom activities for educators that will eliminate the need for them to research shorebirds themselves, which is a hurdle I've encountered working with teachers for bringing shorebirds into the school curriculum. The first big step to reaching Siberia is to raise awareness for wing threads and the shorebirds right here in Australia. To share shorebirds are awesome and spread the shorebird word, I'm planning a six month journey flying my microlight around Australia in 2022 called Wing Threads Flight Around Oz. The flight will start in March and finish in October in the Shelbird capital, Broome, Western Australia. The entire flight is a similar distance to what the Shelbird's annual migration is, about 20,000 kilometres. On the way, we'll visit schools and libraries to share Shelbirds Are Awesome with students and teachers from local communities in over 70 towns. Shorebird conservation can beg the question, why should I care about birds that are going extinct? How does that affect me? With our modern lifestyles, it's easy to forget that we're animals too and regard nature as something separate to us that we escape to for the holidays rather than a living network that we are inextricably a part of. Storytelling and the creative arts help to overcome these barriers by providing fun and engaging avenues for people to form a relationship with the shorebirds and other species in their local environment and begin to see them as indicators your consent on a few items to continue. of the health of our ecosystems. Further, they can help people to understand the value of wetland habitats and why biodiversity matters in relation to themselves, which has the power to translate into environmental stewardship. While not everyone cares about shorebirds, most people are inspired by adventure and love bunny cartoons. <laughs> In this way, the Shorebirds Are Awesome children's book and Wing Threads Flight Around Oz Adventure are both vehicles with the potential to engage a wide audience unfamiliar with shorebirds, both young and old. Threats like species extinction, climate change and plastic pollution are real. So it's vitally important that we frame these issues in ways that engage and empower everyone to bring about real change for our future, especially young people. Through these creative pursuits that bring together my passions in life, birds flying and drawing, it's my dream that one day shorebirds like the redneck stin and Bartel Godwit will become as well known as the panda orangutan and blue whale and deemed as worthy of protection. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. That was absolutely marvellous.
And uh, thank you for being so courageous and finding new creative way to reach audiences. That's really hard, so moving. Um, thank you for that. Please, everyone, if you have questions for Millie, don't forget to put them in the Q&A and she will try to answer them. Okay, we're moving to the next one, which will be a talk by uh, Yu Yat Tung from the Hong Kong Birdwatching Society. He will be talking about the blackface phone bill. Go ahead, Yat Tung. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, um, thank you very much for the nice invitation for this uh, uh, webinar. I think it's just a very meaningful and very useful uh, uh, function and uh, uh, events for us to promote the uh, uh, conservation in, in the day for the days of the World Migratory Bird Days. So I like to share our experience about the uh, uh, blackface spoonbill conservation with to all of you. So. Um, you may be interested, you may be curious to know why I use, uh, I talk about Barefoot Spoonbill in this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I actually, I, I need to tell you that uh, shorebirds is very, very, uh, is facing very, very high risk now, but so do the Barefoot Spoonbill. It is because they share the same habitat. Therefore, uh, their behavior, the Spoonbill and the shorebird would have a very, very similar uh, life history behavior. Uh, for their for the same habitat because they need mud flat. So uh, you may and then you may you may interest to know what, what are the difference for them from this picture you see uh, spoonbill is in white color uh, that is very uh, different from the other shrubbers. And then I would like to just tell you one thing a uh, very simple uh, difference between the spoonbill and the swat shrubbers. Shrubbers just need to feed the items in the mud uh, with uh, wading through the mud flat. Spoonbill actually need to feed the fish in the water column uh, in the, on the, on the muff that during the, the tides are a little bit higher. Uh, so they live in the same area. Uh, they, they have very similar thing. They just have a very little difference on the feeding part. So Spoonbill need a little bit on uh, high water. Uh, Shorebird just need to feed in the uh, low water. And of course, you, you, you can see, uh, you can imagine the size of the spoonbills are different, uh, is different from the, uh, the, short, uh, the size of the shorebirds uh, because uh, the spoonbill is up to about 70 centimeters of the body length. Uh, take an example of the spoonbill sandpaper, which is just about 15 centimeters. So uh, the size is the, uh, the uh, they have the size different, but they, they, they behave actually, I would say the behavior of the spoonbill is very much like the shorebirds. So first of all, I'll tell you uh, some background story. Uh, in the late 90, in the late uh, 1980s, uh, the Hong Kong Birding Society uh, ring the first alarm for the blackface spoonbill because when our uh, senior uh, members they collect the information about the blackface spoonbill, they find uh, the number is very very low. Uh, they just find about fewer than uh, 300 birds. So on that time, uh, we already think, oh, would it be a problem for these birds? Uh, then after some other uh, info, uh, literature searching, literature review, we still find that spoonbill, the breakfast spoonbill, uh, cannot have very high number. By that time, uh, the breakfast spoonbill already uh, was already uh, listed, classified as a critical endangered. Apart from this low number, we actually know nothing about the breakfast spoonbill. Therefore, the people start to make a very serious concern about the, uh, the risk uh, the, the, uh, of, of the spoonbill for, uh, uh, for the uh, extinction. I just say it, I just say it, when we have very low information, so we have very, very few information. So uh, people on that time already suggest we need to do more survey to find out how many birds, how many factory spoonbill in the world. Uh, the, the survey has started in 1993 after for uh, one uh, after for several years of the census uh, they want to uh, uh, they revise it they want to do it uh, in a, with a better result with a better effort so uh, after that uh, in 1997 they start the first synchronized census uh, in January uh, on by that by that census they want to know how many backface uh, actually uh, could be found in the world so we think uh, then on that time, we think that is uh, successful. That was successful because uh, we could find the number of the breakfast spoon bill, we could find the distribution of the breakfast spoon bill, and then we can link up the people together. So uh, after all the uh, good result, good effort, uh, the event, uh, the, 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 the census can, uh, actually the, becomes an annual event uh, for the breakfast spoon bill uh, conservation work. Uh, I, 
just show you uh, this picture uh, about the, uh, the census in this year. So we have uh, uh, the census in the, uh, January this year. And by this, uh, and this is the situation on uh, how we do it, the, the, cent, uh, the, the count in light post. So we, we, we need people uh, to help us to do the counting and then we look for the birth and then we count the birth. Uh, and then find, and we actually could uh, get the volunteers uh, from many, many places in uh, around the Southeast, uh, around the East Asia. Uh, so up to, uh, for, in this census, we could have up to uh, over uh, 120 uh, uh, service, service sites and more than 200 uh, a volunteer could help us to do the, uh, the census. And we also find that uh, during our, uh, our census, we could find more and more spoon bill uh, uh, over the years. So after more than 20 years of the uh, census, we also find the number is increasing. Uh, from uh, late 1990s, uh, we just have fewer than 1,000 uh, 1, birds. And then in the, uh, after, uh, before the uh, 2010, and then we already reached the 2,000 level. And now in the years of the uh, 2020, we could have very, very close to 5,000 spurs. So we believe all this kind of, uh, uh, we, with this increasing number, uh, different kinds of the uh, construction effort actually could uh, get a very successful uh, uh, meaning and the result for us to protect the spoon bill. And I need to tell you one thing it is, which is very important for us is to get more people involved, get more people engaged to the whole uh, story of the Bay Spoon Bill. One of the uh, major work we do, I think it is very useful, is to, uh, be, uh, to, to have the recruitment of the surveyors to do the Bay Spoon Bill census. So first, we could also uh, train them to do the survey. We make sure the, uh, the quality of the data. And then when they, have, uh, when they could come with us and that we have a more manpower to do the simple census. And then after that, after we have the result, we can tell the story to the other people. Engagement is a very important part for the whole census and also for the first base spoon bill conservation as, as, uh, 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 stories. After we engage the people, we also need, the share, need to share the result about them. So for all the surveyor, for all the regional coordinator, I must share the report for them. This is very important work because they think they have the ownership uh, of the program. When I have the data, I share with them and then they can speak to their people in the, uh, with, with their own language. This is a very, they, they reflect it to me. They think it is a very, very good way to promote a, a, a species conservation. Of course, when we have a chance, uh, we could definitely promote a scientific paper for that because it is the way to show the professionalism of our work. And it is very important for the uh, higher level uh, communication as well. So um, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to have uh, some achievement uh, for the Buffet Spoon Bill. Uh, from here, you could see some milestones. So from we start the discussion in the uh, Bird Life Meeting in 1994 up to now, in the uh, year, 2000, uh, year uh, 2020, we're still working on the Buffet Spoon Bill. Though it has a very uh, high increase of the number, we still think uh, the very first movement can still have some threats uh, for, uh, because the, you know, the, the mud flat is still facing a very serious problem all around the, uh, this East Asia, uh, um, Australasian region. So uh, when we have a number, when we have a, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the information, uh, we share our uh, information with other people, we also need to see how we could use this kind of the information so uh, action plan, uh, they, when we make the action plan for the conservation ep, uh, ep, uh, effort, uh, we make the conservation strategies, we need this kind of the, uh, information. So um, I would like to summarize uh, all, my, uh, all, our, all our works about the Buffet Spoon Bill. So I, I just need to repeat it. Uh, ground works are always important and it is irreplaceable because it helps us to know what happened to us on the site and also uh, this is the most urgent information we need uh, for our uh, on-site um, management. And then we definitely need government support. Of course, we also need international uh, NGO to support uh, all the work uh, because we work on the migratory birds. Migratory birds always have uh, uh, distribution range cover different countries. So internationally, uh, government uh, involvement is very, very important for the success of the uh, conservation, uh, uh, conservation of the migratory species. 
so I just make uh, my yeah the, the yeah the, a first promotion for the next census here. So um, yeah, I I, I was yeah stop for this presentation now. So join us uh, to be a very smooth surveyor in the coming January. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yatun, for that excellent talk and uh, your last call for people joining the census is already one of the questions is of somebody who wants to join them. So uh, maybe you can go to the Q&A and explain how people can join the census because there are volunteers around. So that's really great. So moving to the um, final talk in our first session is about community conservation action for shorebirds in Australia. So it's site action plans are making a real difference. And this presentation is by Marta Ferenzi from BirdLife Australia. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marta Ferenzi and I work at BirdLife Australia. Uh, it was already amazing to, to hear all these stories and, um, and, and specific projects on species. Um, and what I would like to do today is to talk a little bit of uh, a broader picture of what we are doing in Australia about shorebird conservation. And specifically, I will talk about the side action plans for uh, migratory shorebird habitat in Australia. I wanted to start my presentation uh, with this opening slide where it has our uh, slogan, our team slogan, which is we are all served by the migration of shorebirds and want to protect and conserve this phenomenon for future generations. And of course, I don't need to explain this because I think all of us here, we do care about shorebirds and that's why we are here today. And of course, we would like to see a world where migratory shorebirds are appreciated and we would like to see that we can uh, provide natural habitat habitat for migratory shorebirds, especially that because they are facing extreme challenges um, on, their, on, the, on their flyway. And of course, with their natural habitat uh, provided, we would like to see that they have uh, peaceful roosting sites and um, introduce predators and also uh, mitigated climate change and pollution. So we can also provide dense food sources for these birds. And I think specifically, uh, you will see uh, Australia is also really significant uh, on the flyway for migratory shorebirds. And um, I think that's a really important goal for us here in Australia to protect the natural habitat for migratory shorebirds. I would like to take you through this little timeline. As I said, I would like to give you a little bit of broader picture of what's happening in, in Australia. And uh, this is a timeline that I called Path to Action. So the conservation of migratory shorebirds in Australia has seen a marked evolution over the past decade with government and conservation organizations such as BirdLife working together to achieve um, improved outcomes for migratory shorebirds. The National Shorebird Monitoring Program that started in 2007 um, have key obje objectives like improved knowledge of national trends in population set site at important uh, sites and better understanding of the drivers and also increased number of skilled counters, volunteers at these sites and, and the established network and increased number of regular monitored sites as well. And also to ensure that all these results are shared widely with site managers and decision makers that would lead to an improved conservation and management um, um, of shorebirds habitat. On our little path to action, I would like to mention two important documents that are part of the evolution of shorebirds conservation in Australia. One of them is the wildlife conservation plan for migratory shorebirds that was published by the government in 2015. And its objectives are to conserve wetland habitats and habitats in Australia, to minimize anthropogenic threats and to identify knowledge gaps. And the next document that I'm going to mention is the migratory shorebird conservation action plan that addresses key threats in close alignment with the Australian government's uh, wildlife conservation plan. And it pro provides strategic approach. So uh, the Migratory Shorebird Program, where are we are on, on timeline right now? Currently, we coordinate specific projects uh, to meet the objectives in WCP and the MSCAP. And part of this process, we um, uh, the creating accessible knowledge for research stakeholders and decision makers are really important. That's, and, and we arrive now at the Director of Important Migratory Shorebird Habitat. Um, which is another really important document that's uh, hopefully going to be published by the end of the year that has all 
the sites listed in Australia uh, based on their international and national criteria using significant thresholds. So I wanted to show you this map um, where we have all the internationally and nationally important sites uh, listed. So this uh, map is from the directory. We have 151 internationally important sites and 282 nationally important sites. As you can see, all around Australia, there is quite a lot of significant sites for migratory shorebirds. So it's really important that we focus on uh, conserving this habitat uh, for these birds. So if we're gonna go back to this uh, little timeline, we're gonna arrive at the topic of my today's talk, which is the side action plans for important migratory shorebird habitat. So what are these side action plans? So these side action plans gonna um, target the key sites, some of these key sites and their communities. And um, they identify threats and key management needs specifically for this site. And then they also gather all the, the existing management plans and we, we are trying to uh, fine-tune these management plans and of course add also what we learned about these sites and it's all happening through a local stakeholders process that we have been doing in the last few months as well that unfortunately all had to happen online um, but um, the really important part of the side action plan is the objective strategies and actions section which lists all the fast track high impact actions that we would like to be implemented at each of these sites. And the goal is, uh, the last point is really important that we would like to see an established long-term sustainable and local ownership of these communities of their site of the important shorebird uh, habitat. So on this little graph, I would like to show you what is the process of the site action planning for the for this habitat. So first is the assessment. I already mentioned this. So we're gonna target these key sites that are listed in the directory, which are either nationally or internationally important. Of course, we've got quite a lot of international sites that we know there's international numbers of uh, migratory shorebirds present, but mm, there may not be a threat present. Maybe there's a very remote site, so there is no human disturbance, reasonably doing okay. So we, all, we also have a look at the threats and we assess the threats and select the sites there and of course um, it, we also have to pick sites where we have uh, funding for um, so I just put an example here this is the Kurong National Park in South Australia where we develop a site action fly which is a uh, uh, very very important site for several migratory shorebirds the next step in our site action planning is the engagement so it's really really important I think some of you already mentioned in your talks before that engaging with the locals with the with the stakeholders um, that's really crucial um, in, in, in these conservation actions. And um, uh, part of these local workshops, we invite the local farmers, uh, catchment authorities, rangers, um, uh, the researchers who wor work in the area, the farmers, so everyone who's involved in managing the site. Um, and then after that, we probably have a uh, going through all the management plans, talking to all the locals, we get to the really important part of the site action planning, which is the implementation. As I mentioned, we have a really important part of the document where we list all the actions. And then th th these are all various actions, for example, putting up signage at important sites. There's a lot of disturbance on the beach, for example. It's about uh, community engagement events or also workshops for volunteers or, or counters. Um, and, uh, but also we list uh, research ideas for the sites, uh, addressing knowledge gaps, or also working, working together uh, with people who are responsible for the hydrology of the site and uh, writing up actions for that as well, if, if the hydrology of a site needs to uh, recover. And then we get to our next step, which is the monitoring. Um, Again, I would like to uh, emphasize that, that we would like to develop these side action plans as a tool and we really would like to um, start this process by having all these communities engage and so they feel they have the, the ownership of these side action plans and also the implementation and the monitoring of these plans would be in their hands and BirdLife would overview this, pro uh, this process. Hopefully, after a few years when things are going really well, and then we arrive at our last uh, uh, section, which is the revision that the plan we plan that um, these side action plans would be revised every five years. So I just put a few covers uh, up here that there are some side action plans that have already been finalized. 
I just wanted to show you the map. Uh, we came back to our uh, important sites map that uh, so far we developed uh, 10 sites in South the state of South Australia and then another six sites in Victoria. And then we also have uh, four sites in New South Wales. Most of them are internationally important sites that we developed the site action plans for. So, so far what we have achieved is that we identified uh, all the threats at these 20 sites and facilitated the workshop. So we already know all the managers, the locals, the farmers quite well. So we're engaging with them uh, at these 20 sites. And uh, most of these sites we have, uh, we've already run community engaging workshops as well, or we have already planned uh, some for this coming year. And we already have 20 site action plans uh, drafted up I just wanted to show you a few uh, examples from, from our uh, plants. For example, this is um, uh, one of the hydrology model for the size that we, we uh, see that the lake actually dries out uh, before the birds arrive. And we, we know that uh, there has been uh, uh, research that uh, if we put the regulator on the drain, then we could actually extend the flooding of the area. And um, because historically this side, Lake Hodon North actually, and also Lake Hodon South has been really important for migratory shorebirds, a crucial site. But unfortunately, just because the, the water is not managed well, the, dry, the, the uh, water just dries out before the birds arrive. So we built an action around this as well, but there is com uh, community actions like weeding because vegetation encroachment is a real issue um, that's covering um, uh, the sites. And um, we also have actions for uh, community engagement and also for ID workshops um, for locals rangers and also volunteers who would be joining in into the monitoring program and also we have quite a lot of actions included to put up signage as i mentioned earlier and of course we have a whole sepa section as well for each site about engagement and community awareness and of course the next step is the implementation of the plan so uh, as you can see we already have many many plans and uh, we already see that all this process naturally started to happen at these sites and a lot of uh, uh, communities are engaging and um, uh, of course the, the crucial question is if we have funding but uh, on the other hand even just a, a little bit of funding a little bit of money at each of these sites can make a, a massive difference so we are on the track i just wanted to show you this map again so um, as you see we are busy with all these sites that we already have developed a site action plan for but if you have a look at with red dots the all the internationally significant sites in australia that we don't have a site action plan you can see that we still have a lot to do and some of them are really really crucial for migratory shorebirds and we would like to see of course those red dots turning uh, green as well and then uh, we see actions happening at these sites. Uh, these uh, circles just represent, represent the first, the present, that we only have that many. The little green is uh, how many sites we develop out of all site action plans for. And of course, we would like to see the future if we have developed site action plans for all the internationally important sites, then it would be turning red. And of course, we would like to see it all greening out in Australia and we provide a uh, um, uh, safe habitat for migratory shorebirds. But of course, it's a process and a long way to go. And I would like to close this up with again, linking back to my opening slide that uh, I think, again, we would like to see uh, a world, as Millie also mentioned, uh, a world where birds are, migratory shorebirds are appreciated and um, we would like to see that also providing uh, natural habitat with roosting sites and feeding sites for migratory shorebirds. And I think site action plants are a really good tool to do this. And I think my time is up, so I will leave it there. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you uh, for this excellent talk, Marta. We're now entering the Q&A. Uh, session, a short session, just to quickly go to some answers that have, uh, like some questions that have been asked uh, online. Um, don't forget to put in a question for, for Marta, um, if you have one for her. So the first questions that came up that we think would be worth answering now, is pulling it up on screen, sorry. Um, so the first question, the two questions for Siam about spoonbill sandpipe. And the first question is, and I'll ask them both Siam and then you can 
make a combined answer of it. So how do you convince the hunters to give up hunting shorebirds and take up the alternatives? And secondly, have you been able to link up with any Russian conservationists? And what is the situation like for spoonbill sandpiper in Russia? Uh, over to you, Siam. Thanks, thanks, Baron. So the hunting is illegal in Bangladesh and it's not a very respectful occupation. So they never really wanted to go and hunt birds and they always wanted something else. And they were so poor they didn't have any option. So we, from our project, we provided them with that option and they gladly took it. Um, and the second question uh, on, on Russia is that we, of course, uh, collaborate with a wide variety of international organizations, including Russia. In fact, the chairman of the School of Sun Viper Task Force, um, um, he is from Russia and we work with uh, Birds Russia. And also I will take this opportunity to acknowledge some of our funding organizations because it's a broad project. So the center for conservation work goes beyond Bangladesh and it, it covers uh, you know, from Russia to Myanmar and other countries. So I'd like to acknowledge the RSVB who have been funding us for many years and also um, ICFC, International Conservation Fund of Canada. They have stepped in recently and uh, supporting our work, especially in monitoring grounds. Um, and also Rainforest Trust, who uh, recently started to support our work in monitoring grounds. So yeah, um, so we, we have a uh, work with a wide variety of um, different stakeholders and that we need, need for um, migratory species conservation. It has to go beyond one or two countries. Thank you. Over to you, Barry. Excellent, Siam. Um, I think there's plenty more to say about this, uh, this topic of uh, convincing people to take up different actions um, and, uh, and the collaboration along the flyway. There's a question about blackface spoonbill from Paul. Um, blackface spoonbills is an inspiring conservation story and great work too. You also, uh, can you explain one or two main reasons for the dramatic recovery of the species? The, the key things. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Paul, for the questions. I think uh, one of the major uh, contributions is the protection of the breeding sites. Uh, I think uh, Korea government actually do put a lot of uh, resources and also they do quite a lot of things to promote the uh, species awareness. Uh, this is important. Uh, and then for also from the region I have in uh, my, my area and also in other areas, when people know the birds and when people doesn't, uh, do not know the birds, it makes the difference. Uh, when they know the birds, uh, they, they really want to protect them. They will uh, get more feeling about the story of the birds. So yeah, when, I, when we do all the things about the Beverly Spoon Bill, we tell the story. I think it, it, is, yeah, it is very important. And, and also, yeah, the, the Korean government uh, also do a very good job on that. Excellent. So that's key. You need to show the people what the bird looks like. Um, <laughs> okay, so I was sort of expecting a lot of questions for Millie. Just one question I have for her is, isn't it so scary to be up there being like a bird and you're used it? You've only been flying for so shortly. And, uh, and you're taking these long, long travels. So just uh, perhaps the question is, can you assure me that it's safe and you will get back on the ground safely, just as you hope the birds will do? Yeah, I don't find it scary being up in the air. I suppose it, being a microlite though, it is um, limited in the kinds of conditions that you can fly in. So um, yeah, I don't go up if it's uh, more than a 15 knot wind. Uh, and if it's more than 10 knots on crosswind for landing. So yeah, it's best to fly first thing in the morning or uh, later in the evening just before sunset so you're not getting a lot of thermal activity. Um, and I see the flight around Australia, like I have to think of it as lots of shorter cross-country flights. So it's really broken down into lots of short flights so that they can be done safely and um, within a, you know, with, with working within my limits. So, because you do get tired flying the microwave for a long period of time. Yeah. Well, that reassures me. Okay, one final question for Martha. Um, um, oh, sorry, no, I lost the question. Oh, no, here's the guy. So there's a question as how beneficial it is currently with the pandemic for the birds that are dependent on beaches with so fewer people being on those beaches. Do you see a, 
Is that an, an improvement for the birds? Well, not really. Outdoor activities are still a lot on the beaches. So <laughs> unfortunately, there is not uh, uh, less people on, on the beaches right now. And uh, probably soon in the, in the season when migratory shorebirds are around, uh, well, everything's going to be open up again. And I think especially that these people are going to get out from the big cities. It's going to be super busy. So unfortunately, we, we don't really see that now. Okay. That's okay. Okay, there are further questions uh, also for Marta um, on the Q&A. I propose that Marta have a look at that. Some are, are fairly technical and I think they're better answered uh, in writing. Um, so if you will allow me, we now move on to the second session um, of the talks. And the, one, the next one is by Adrian Regan from the PUCO... Uh, Pukorokoro Miranda Showbird Center, sorry for that, and it's showbird site identification in probably one of the places we all want to know about because it's in North Korea. So over to you, Adrian. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay, well, I am involved with the Pukorokoro Miranda Naturalist Trust on the Firth of Thames in New Zealand. As you can see, the little circle down at the bottom of the flyway. Uh, We've been following the, I've been involved since the mid 1980s uh, down there and we've been concerned about the declining numbers, particularly of godwits and red knots, uh, Bartow godwits and red knots, of which we have a considerable number in New Zealand. And we started asking questions about what was happening to them and why we were looking after them at uh, uh, in New Zealand, it didn't seem uh, very good if they were disappearing somewhere else and maybe we should be looking outside New Zealand and seeing what we could do. And so we, we particularly got uh, involved with um, Yalu Jang up on the border with DPRK, uh, which was turned out to be the Godwit Central, uh, uh, the Bartow Godwit Central place that Mark Barter first found in 1999. Uh, and then we set up a program working with the Aojang National Nature Reserve from 2004 through to, well, to the current times, but we did 10 years of surveys up there. And uh, so that was good to know where the godwits were, but the other species we didn't know much about was the, was the red knot. And there seemed to be, from, from the counts that were done, there seemed to be a good number missing. And by sort of the mid 2000s, almost the entire coast of the Yellow Sea and Bohai Sea had been surveyed at least once by various people. Uh, and only about 25% of the red knots had been accounted for. And most of those are in the Bohai. So where were the others or did we not have the numbers right? Well, when you look at a map like this, you can see the big part of the uh, Yellow Sea that hadn't been surveyed was the DPRK. And as we were working at Yalu Jang right on the border and watching birds fly across there every day, uh, we, I decided, well, we ought to try and go into the DPRK and have a look for the missing red knots. But of course, getting in DPRK was, was never going to be an easy option. So I started thinking about it in 2000. And it wasn't until uh, 2007 when the New Zealand Minister for Foreign Affairs made an official visit to DPRK. Uh, and when it was announced that he was going there, we, uh, we wrote to him and said, this is what we're, he was going there to try and sort of solve the nuclear arms issues. And we thought, well, he probably won't get anywhere with that, but he might be able to help us get in there to survey shorebirds. So we asked him to ask the North Koreans uh, and he came back having asked them and they said, yes, that would be, would be uh, wonderful. So we went in, it took two years to plan and we went in and joined up with the Nature Conservation Union of Korea uh, to undertake some surveys. We, we didn't know great, we had to rely a lot on Google Earth Images to find out where we thought it would be go were good to go because the, the Koreans that we were working with knew nothing about shorebirds at that time. Uh, and so they, we were sort of guiding them as where we should go based on images which we couldn't show them and they had no access to. 
but we chose sites like this one, uh, which was a reclamation site, but there were tidal flats outside these reclamations. And like a lot of Asia, there's, there is reclamation work going on in the DPRK, but at a, at a slower rate and in generally in a smaller amount. We found sites like this and uh, found good numbers of birds within them. Uh, but we also found some disturbing sites like this one here, where you can see, hopefully you can see the numbers of birds we, we found at this one particular site, including 13,000 Dunlins, 6,000 East, Far Eastern Curlews, so huge numbers of birds, very few red knots. In fact, we found almost none in the whole country. Uh, but this site that we visited in 2017 was already uh, having a sea walls built to uh, to reclaim some of that land. Well, now that's extended out in just the last four years to 75 square kilometers of tidal flats and the shallow seas that are now being reclaimed. So this is of more of concern, but there are still considerable mud flats around. But what we don't know is, is how much food there is in those mud flats for the birds. We haven't been able to get permission to do any benthic sampling in these in these areas at all they will not even allow us to step onto a mud flat at the moment we, we, we keep working on it and hopefully one day that will happen uh, a lot of these reclamations are not for land they are for uh, uh, well they were initially for jellyfish farming uh, so they, they they're filling them up with water but not draining it and reclaiming it as, as land. But the, uh, the jellyfish market with the sanctions, that, that sort of dried up. So we're not quite sure what's going to happen with some of these large ponds that have now been created. Um, we're hoping that, uh, you know, that, that it will slow down. The awareness for shorebirds has grown immensely uh, it, during the years that we've been going there. So we've done six surveys and this map shows uh, just indicates the sort of points along the coast where we've we've uh, visited. Most of the rest of the coast that looks like we haven't visited is actually sort of tends to be more rocky uh, with very few tidal flat areas. We are trying to do more down in the south but of course that being near uh, South Korea has caused um, quite a lot of uh, difficulties. Um, but the key site that we have found, was, which is the one in Sindo, which is right on the border with China and the Yaolujiang National Nature Reserve. And when I investigated trying to go to this island in 2016, the people we work with there didn't even know the island was part of North Korea. They thought it was uh, part of China because it's on the other side of the main Yalu River. But we did and this indicates just how close it is to the Yalujang Nature Reserve. You can see the large new port that's been built uh, south of uh, uh, for the for Dandong, and that's sort of blocking a lot of the tidal flow for the Yalujang Reserve. But the Sindo, the mud flats in the sort of rectangle below the Sindo, the island there, are extremely good for birds, uh, and it's probably one of the least disturbed or, or altered habitats in the entire um, Yellow Sea area. We, it still has a natural coastline almost entirely around it. It's extremely restricted uh, as far as human activity uh, is concerned uh, because it's so close to the Chinese border. And uh, the Koreans, when we, took, we got them there, were absolutely blown away by what we found. No red knots, unfortunately, still can't find those. Uh, but 13,000 godwits and 5,000 curlews there. Um, birds do move across from the, uh, the river from China, from uh, Yalu Jiang. Uh, one of the great, the, the very satisfying things about this, as I say, in 2016, the people we work with in North Korea didn't know this belonged to them. Uh, and now they're pushing for this to become a World Heritage Site. And it certainly deserves to be. It is, I think, without doubt, the, the, the finest piece of coastal 
wetland uh, in still in in the Yellow Sea, huge natural reed beds, uh, vast mud flats. Uh, the tide there is a sea wall, but it's a it's a long way inland, and uh, even on big tides it barely reaches that. Um, so briefly, though, I just want to thank those people, the minister and the various organisations that have helped fund us for this this work. It's a uh, it's quite challenging. Uh, the uh, access is, is very restrictive. We, we are not allowed to go anywhere we want. We can't go on our own anywhere. So we have to work with the people. And, and basically we say where we want to go and then it's up to them to try and make it happen. Uh, and so far we're doing right. We were to be there again this year to survey new sites that we haven't visited obviously that failed through with COVID and doesn't look promising for next year but hopefully uh, we will continue this work it's become a bigger project than we initially anticipated we thought just we would go in for two or three years uh, and now it's, it's becoming a longer term project but because they're, they're so enthusiastic now about uh, protecting their wetlands we feel you know, we're, we're very keen to help them uh, and it's been a very positive, there's been some very positive outcomes. So uh, I think that's, that's it briefly, so I'm trying to stick to my time limits. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. You, you stuck perfectly to your time. And, and it's great to see that these data, these valuable data and knowledge about what's happening in Korea will contribute to the World Heritage Site nomination. That will be absolutely stunning. So thank you for that. Moving on to the next speaker. So the next one is from Chris. Uh, Chris is from BirdLife Australia and will tell us about floating roasts. Chris, over to you. Okay. So I picked you this, here we go. This is pretty stunning stuff uh, out there on the water. We've got about uh, 10,000 birds, shorebirds circling above our heads. Um, it's a majestic sight. You know, I was struck with awe just uh, standing there um, until you realize that uh, it's actually a beautiful situation, but it's also a desperate situation. These birds shouldn't be circling around our heads. Um, they're actually forced to be up in the air. And while they're up there, they're actually wasting precious energy. And this is because they don't have an appropriate site at high tide to roost. So this is what's called an aerial roost. And this is a big problem um, for these birds. So for those of you who don't know, the, the, uh, just a bit of a background on the basics of ecology for shorebirds. So shorebirds need a few things, all right? So they just need somewhere that they can feed. And this is dictated by the tide. So when the tide's down, these big, beautiful mud flats in coastal areas are exposed and they can spread out and uh, you can have hundreds of thousands of shorebirds in a, a, a stretch of coastline feeding very happily on, on the mud. Tide comes in, that habitat uh, is then covered. So they need somewhere where they can rest and conserve the energy that will enable them to continue their migration. Uh, so they're normally sand dunes or sand spits, uh, areas that are beyond the tide. But when you build beyond the tide, there's jetty sticking out here, or as Adrian was just mentioning, uh, when we have reclamation areas, these roosting areas are, uh, become very few and far between. And when you're talking about flocks of 10,000 birds, they need more capacity uh, than just a small amount, the small amount that's left. This is what I'm gonna talk about today. Some novel approaches and interventions which we're trialing uh, mostly to uh, mitigate some of the threats to uh, um, roosting sites in the Yellow Sea and particularly uh, in South Korea. So this is the site which we're working on and this is part of a uh, um, larger project called the Conserving Birds of Kum Estuary um, project and we're working in Sochon County which is uh, just north of the infamous Simon Kum in, in um, the mid-west coast of South Korea. And we're working with a lot of great partners, uh, including uh, BirdLife International Asia. Now this site, as you can see, stunning mudflats, still relatively uh, pristine. Uh, and it's now that Simon Kung uh, has fallen in its ranks, this is the most significant site for shorebirds 
uh, in all of South Korea. Uh, so it has, during uh, peak uh, migration time, you might get 170,000 shorebirds filtering through over the space of a couple of months. Certainly one of the most significant sites in the, the Yellow Sea for a couple of species which are important to Australians because uh, they're listed as critically endangered, the great knot and the eastern curlew. Also very significant for spoonbill sandpiper and as we heard about earlier today, black-faced spoonbill. And not only is it a Ramsar site and an IBA, but uh, similarly to uh, we, we just heard from Adrian, the Kumestri and Jung Hung Coast, Sochon County, uh, looking to have these nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, not only because of the biodiversity, but because of the historic fishing villages and practices which they still uh, undertake in the areas. So we went over there looking to see what we could do, contribute to the ongoing conservation that uh, the Koreans are already doing there. So we had did a quick analysis, quick uh, risk assessment and opportunities to how we can contribute. And so we looked around at all the known roosting areas uh, north of Simon Kum on the Kum Estuary and Jung Hung Coast. And of the uh, nine main roosts, six of the, sorry, six of the seven main roosts are not available at 54% um, at of the high tide. So half of the time when the high tide reaches its peak, all of these sites with the X's on them aren't actually available for shorebirds. So they've got to find other sites to go to. And, you know, they might, might include sea walls, rocky coasts. Uh, you can see up in the top right there, uh, they're in a shrimp pond. Uh, the bottom there, they're actually ro roosting on a dredge pipe, which was responsible for uh, ruining their habitat in the first place. So quite ironic. We thought, how can we turn this around? Normally in Australia, what we can do is we can find some re retreat habitat or we can work to, uh, with local land managers to restore roosts or even build terraformed uh, art, um, artificial roosts out of locally sourced uh, materials. But that wasn't an option in Korea. We had to think outside the box a bit. Now I remembered a photo that a mate of mine had taken in Marimbula, which is in New South Wales in Australia, at an oyster farm. And here's the photo. And this is an Eastern curlew, which is standing on a, an oyster bag. So these are aquaculture bags. There's oysters inside there. The floats keep it afloat, so it rises and lowers with the tide, and the oysters grow um, at, a, at an amazing rate. It's a new form of uh, uh, aquaculture that was developed in Australia. And I thought, geez, could we make floating islands out of these so you can put them anywhere and, and uh, perhaps move them around to, to near uh, the feeding areas? Jumped in the car, took some uh, nice dry white wine and met, met the oyster farmers and it turned out that they were keen to show me all the, the birds that were roosting on their oyster farms. And this could be a great option, I thought. So they're consistent throughout the tide. They go up and down with the tide. So they're always available. Even at the highest tides, they'll, they'll float right up the top, unlike a lot of the natural roosts, which will underwater with spring tides. They're immune to terrestrial pred predators. They don't get vegetation growing them and uh, they're cheap and very easy to, uh, to move, move and install. And very importantly, they're low impact on the surrounding eco ecosystem. So they won't have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, terrible out uh, outcomes on intertidal areas. So before we went to Korea and brought them this crazy idea, we thought we'd better try it on, in our own backyard. So we tried it at a couple of Ramsar sites um, in Victoria. Uh, so that's the Western Port Phillip Bay and the Hunter Estuary in New South Wales. And we got good proof of concept. So here you can see some sharp tail sandpipers, a lot of waterfowl, uh, herons, and we even got some threatened terns, uh, fairy terns roosting on them. So although these birds in, in our habitats had natural roosting options, they were roosting and sometimes in feeding on our artificial floating roosts. So with this in our hands, we went back over to Korea. We worked with the locals, including Dr. Young Min Moon, who was our man on the ground there. And I took over at Kangaroo Island Oyster Farmer, Bob Nichols, you can see up in the corner. Uh, and the three of us set, up, set about installing a few roosts in the Kormestri and Jung Hung Coast. And as you can see, that's a very small team. We got a lot of bags in. 
And you can see in that top right image, the birds are starting to uh, accumulate along that rising tide. And within half an hour, that tide was right up to where we were standing. The bags were floating and the birds were in the, in the air and we towed those bags out. Seconds after finishing the install, you can see that middle image, two Terex sandpipers from that huge swirling flock we saw in the video swooped down and tested out the, the roost. There we thought we'd add high fives all around and we cracked open a few bottles of soju uh, and maybe a premature salvation, but we, we installed the cameras and we kept watch. A couple of days later, we had 30 to 40 birds roosting on them. You can see down the bottom. A couple of weeks later, we had about 300 birds. And then southern migration, they were packed to capacity. So here's an image of about 500 birds uh, filling what was our initial trial roost, a very small trial, um, and just shows the desperation of these birds that they're so quick, quick to adapt to using these new um, artificial roosts. And you can see in the background, there's, there's no room to roost. That's actually a seawall with the tide hitting it. So uh, no room for uh, the birds outside on natural sites. So across all the sites, what are our results from the first couple of years? And this is a photo just from um, last week. See so Eastern Curly Terex sandpiper and a couple of other small sandpiper species. Across Victoria and the Korean sites, we've had 52 species of water birds, 31 species of shorebirds, including critically endangered species like the uh, Eastern Curly utilising the roosts. Um, we've had, as I said, those big max abundances of around 500 birds. Uh, we've had uh, and a general idea of what conditions these birds will utilise the roost, and they only really need to use them for a small part of the tide. And, you know, it's only when uh, the other roosts aren't available that they, they need to use them. Uh, so the max, when the, the tide is at its highest, so the spring tide within uh, the tide cycle, and when there's low wind, it seems to be the, the, the most appropriate uh, times that these birds are using the roosts. Uh, and they've created their own ecosystems within them. So within the bag, uh, we've still put not growing oysters like they do in the aquaculture industry, uh, but empty shells, mussels and, um, and oyster shells and scallop shells. And these get colonised by all sorts of lovely little invertebrates, which the birds can feed on throughout the tide um, while they are perched up there. And preliminary results of our thermoregulation tests also indicate that they might have great thermal properties. So rather than standing on rocks or hot sand, these birds are able to keep their feet wet uh, during the spring and summer months. Uh, when temperatures can soar and uh, improve their uh, fitness long term. This is just a trial. I've got a, as I wind up here, I've got a stress. It's just a trial. These are really a last resort intervention. So these are just meant to be used in emergency cases. So we encourage land managers when they can, as I said at the top of the presentation, to restore uh, and optimise what they have. So try to turn back the clock and, on, on uh, any uh, terrible um, in, uh, root roost uh, impacts which have already occurred and, and maximise what you have. If that can't, um, if, if that's not possible, you might want to uh, investigate a, a floating roost while you uh, troubleshoot other solutions. So. In the case of Korea, this is a solution which we've put in temporarily while we investigate uh, other solutions to roost management. That brings me to where to next. So first step is going outside. So I'm in Melbourne here, we're stuck inside. I was meant to be in Korea in May, but obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, so when the restrictions lift, we'll be able to go out and, and view the roosts again. and uh, we'll assess how they've gone in their first year, restructure them. We're working with some fantastic uh, industrial designers through uh, RMIT to find non-plastic solutions and potentially uh, uh, repurpose uh, local handicrafts in making these floating roofs so they have a less of an impact uh, in our oceans, but also provide a local uh, economy. 
uh, will improve the thermal qualities of them and we'll look at the, the foraging um, uh, capabilities of birds on the roost and try to maximise those as well. So we're not just providing somewhere to stand and, and roost, but potentially a food source while they're there. Um, so that's the floating roost, uh, great for shorebirds, but also uh, there might be some other adv advantages to them. So here we can see some black-faced spoonbills and egrets and herons uh, taking advantage while the, the smaller birds are out, out at play. Uh, and that's all. I've got a long list of people I'd like to thank, but um, no time to do so. So thank you to everybody, all the boots in the mud. Well, thank you, Chris, for this excellent presentation. Uh, a number of questions has come in uh, about it. One of them, I think you already answered. Somebody was worried about the microplastics, uh, but you're clearly already onto that. Um, everyone, um, this is like an airplane where we shouldn't have announced what the languages are we are speaking. So just for anyone who is a little bit shy on asking a question in English, you can also try Burmese, Japanese, Mandarin, I guess that's it, Thai, sorry for that. So if you feel more comfortable with asking questions in those languages, uh, somebody in our team can, um, can help answer them translate them for the presenters if needed. Okay, now we move on to the next uh, presentation. It is from Ayuwat, from the BirdLife partner in, in uh, Thailand, and it's about the uh, about Paktale, the famous site um, just south of uh, Bangkok. Uh, Ayuwat, go ahead. Hi, so um, I'm gonna be talking about our experience in managing salt pans for shorebirds in Thailand. So um, this is the site, is it, it is called Pak Thale and it is located um, at the, the, the red circle here in Pechaburi province. So it is in a southwestern part of the inner gulf of Thailand. It's actually very close to Bangkok. Bangkok is uh, around the, the middle area of the gulf. And here is the, um, the drone image of how Bakale looks like. So you can see that is a vast area of salt pans and connecting to the, to the Gulf of Thailand. And there's a, a small village area uh, on the right. So salt farming is, um, is, is a big, is a big, uh, is a traditional occupation for that area for many, many hundred years and it provides a basic income for most of the local people there at Bakale. So here in this picture, you can see um, local people collecting the salt, and there are also some stilts in the, in the foreground. And salt pans are incredibly good for birds too, for shorebirds, especially, um, so in Chris's presentation, we, um, we learned about the difficulties in shorebirds finding the high tide uh, roost. But in this area of Thailand, because of salt pans, the, these shorebirds can come in inland to roost in the salt pans. And at the same time, a lot, uh, a lot of them, um, especially the smaller waders, they can also feed in the salt pans too, where the water, um, the water level is not very high. So they can both feed and roost within the salt pans. And these are some of the um, globally endangered species that we find at Bakale. So most of the well-known ones, um, the spoonbill sandpiper, the great knot, spotted green shank, and far eastern curlew. So um, how did we do uh, how did we do our project at Bakale? So it first started with um, a project that was funded by Toyota and uh, was supported also by BirdLife Tokyo. So what we did was that step one, we did shorebird survey to understand the diversity and the habitat preference of shorebirds within the salt pans. So we, um, so we counted the birds uh, within each plot of salt pans because within um, a salt farming system, um, the ponds will be, will be divided into several um, conditions of water, water depth, water salinity, 
And um, so we recorded the species and the number of birds within each plot and also the activity of the birds, whether they were foraging or they were roosting within that certain plot. And also the habitat, um, the, the habitat type of that uh, specific plot. So if you can, uh, so if you look at this photo of the salt pans, you can see that each block has different color. So that um, shows the different stage of the salt, the salt pans. So the white ones are the ones that are crystallizing, ready to be um, harvested. And what we found out from that um, uh, survey was that the water storage and the first evaporation ponds. So these are the two, um, the two ponds that were most utilized by shorebirds. And these ponds are closer to the, to the shore. Um, the water storage pond is the first pond that the salt farmers bring in the seawater before uh, moving that water into the following ponds. So these two ponds um, support more shorebirds because of um, a few various reasons. Number one, it, they have lower sal salinity, so closer to the, um, to, to sea, to, to the sea level. And um, so that means um, these ponds can support more um, benthic fauna. So the shorebirds can also feed within these two uh, stages of ponds. And um, the crystallizing ponds, while well, the crystallizing ponds can only mostly serve for um, roosting shorebirds because, um, because of the really high salinity. And larger waders, they, um, they mostly use the salt pans just for roosting and fly out to the mudflats to feed. And the, for the spoonbill sandpiper, which is um, our main focus for the project. So the spoonbill sandpiper, because it, it is a small bird, so it prefers to forage in the ponds where the water, water, um, the water level is very shallow. So it's mostly less than 10 centimeter depth. And then after we understand the um, habitat preference, um, we, um, we, we had a chance to um, manage the habitat to test our um, predictions on um, how to attract more shorebirds. And thanks to the Department of Marine, Coast, Marine and Coastal Resources, uh, we were able to um, to manage a land of about 24 hectares at Bartale, um, which is uh, taken, uh, which is owned by the, the department. So um, what we did was that uh, that area used to be salt pans too, but they um, that area was abandoned. So the water was left to dry out and you can see from um, the upper photo on the left side that um, the land beca um, became whitish because of the, the salt. So what we did was that we, um, we let the seawater in and um, we let the tide come in and for the ponds that, um, that, that, re that really had um, very high salinity, we let the water sit in that pond for a long while um, to kind of reduce the salinity in that pond. And um, after a few months, that um, area of abandoned salt pan became some sort of semi-natural mudflat further inland. And to, um, we also did um, the monitoring of benthic fauna within this um, this area as well, with um, the help from students from Jula Lungkorn University. So we collected um, the, the mud sample in, in each pond, um, along with monitoring the, the changes in number of species and number of birds that, are, uh, that, that were using those ponds. And we found um, quite a wide variety of um, benthic fauna within that pond. And um, 
and and both the variety and the um, abundance of these invertebrates um, increase really quickly after we are uh, letting the seawater in and after the area became um, semi-natural mudflat uh, we could see that um, there were a lot more birds using that area. Um, so this is uh, the result of our bird monitoring. So you can see that we started um, the habitat management sometime around August. And then after that, uh, because we targeted the Spundu Sandpiper, so we try to um, control the water level to be shallow and supportive of smaller waders. So um, you can see that we got higher number of, for example, red neck stints and broadbill sandpiper later towards um, the end of the uh, migration, uh, which is um, a few months after we started the habitat management. And also the spoonbill sandpiper. Uh, for Thailand, the maximum number that we have each winter would be around 10 birds. And we had five birds within that, um, that area in that winter. And here are some of the photos that I took um, from that area. So after um, the number of benthic fauna increase, after we had um, more crabs, when the crabs um, grew larger, we could see that um, we could attract larger birds into that area too. For example, the Chinese egret, which is one of the globally threatened birds within the EAFP, um, uh, within the EAF. I mean, yeah, so we could see that um, a few months after we letting the seawater in and the, grab, uh, and the crabs became larger, then we could see the Chinese egrets um, using this area more regularly. And also the Nordman's green shank or the spotted green shank as well, which feeds mainly on crabs. We could see that um, the green shanks also came in and feed within that area, which is probably the first time ever that um, we record the spotted green shank feeding inland, not on the mud flat. So um, what we are planning to do is that uh, since last year, with the support from the Rainforest Trust and also public crowdfunding, both in Thailand and internationally, uh, BCST was able to, um, we were able to acquire a piece of land, which is about eight hectare at Bak Thale, and we established it as um, Bak Thale Nature Reserve. So we plan to duplicate this process of managing shorebirds uh, habitat within this nature reserve. But right now we are still in, uh, in, in, in the process of um, preparing uh, the reserve. So you can see that here's a picture of um, on, on the lower side, uh, on the lower right side of the screen, you can see that we are building bird watching hide and you can see big pipes. So we use these pipes to, um, to create an underground pipeline system under the nature reserve, uh, which will um, enable us to share the seawater within uh, the reserve and also with the, the surrounding salt pans. So the salt farmers can also benefit from the water within the reserve too. And this is what the hide will look like once it's finished. Um, this is um, a hide that we built at Kokham, which is another, um, another uh, flyway network site in Thailand. And of course, uh, we cannot, um, our project wouldn't be successful without the support from the local, uh, the local communities. So um, that's also another big part of our, um, our work at Bak Thale. And here, um, uh, photos showing um, the people from Bak Thale and from Kokham villages um, coming together and sharing their experience on, um, on conserving shorebirds. And that's basically it for me. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ayuad. Excellent. And once again, congratulations on acquiring uh, uh, Pactele Nature Reserve.
Uh, we move to our next question, uh, which is by uh, Tinza and Thierry from the Biodiversity and Nature Conservation Association, Banka. Um, it's in, they are from Myanmar, excuse me. Um, they have a pre-recorded session because um, their uh, internet connection is not so table, stable, but they are online. So in case you uh, have questions, do ask them. Um, Ling Li, can you start the video? My name is Ethan Sao and I am the Program Coordinator of Biodiversity and Nature Conservation Association Myanmar. Today, I'm delighted to be here to tell you about the engagement and empowerment of local communities for shorebird conservation in Nanda Island. So let me share my screen. Before I go to other slides, let me briefly introduce with the background of banker in shorebird conservation in Nanda Island. We are also the site as an important habitat of critically endangered spoon based sand fiber since 2008. At the time, there was no development and conservation activities there. From this, we have been working for annually monitoring for shorebirds till now. These are our partnership in shorebird conservation in Nanda Islands. I like to share about the location on Nanda Islands. Nanda Island is small islands with sandy and matte flares. It's located in the northwest coast of Myanmar in the mouth of Mayu estuary close to Sikwe city. There are five villages around Nanda Island. Myanmar is the most important for Pumbi sand fiber as wintering ground. About half of the global population recorded wintering in Myanmar. And more than 5% of the global population of Pumbi sand fiber winters in Nanda Islands annually. In addition, a total of 67 water bird species are recorded in Nanda Islands, including an angel spotted green shan and green knot. Moreover, three species of sea turtles use this for their nesting. Furthermore, this, I, this island also supports the habitat for and danger ERE dolphin. This is the location of Nanda Islands and Mayu estuary. This is the map of spoon based sand fiber recorded in Myanmar. We recorded the most population of spoon based sand fiber in Kafa Motamar and uh, Nanda Island is another important for spoon based sand fiber as wintering ground. To strengthen the conservation, conservation works in Nanda Islands, we formed the local community as community-based organization called Rakhine Biodiversity and Nature Conservation Association, our banker. This organization was officially registered in 2013 and formed with five members of photo governance and two cars of service and patrolling for spoon sand fiber. This is the logo of our banker. In 2016 and 2017, we conducted SIPA program to promote the community's awareness and socioeconomic service uh, to assess their socioeconomic condition and to record backhanders in these villages in collaboration with our partner, our banker, and forest department. Uh, from this service, we recorded four backhanders in two villages, but they were not professional in backhanders. We constructed a in 2017. Uh, for SciCat to, to monitor regularly in and around Nanda Islands. These are the main threats on Nanda Islands, such as the mining, by handing and collecting sea turtle eggs. Uh, these photos are the local communities are selling sea turtle eggs and they hand up birds in local markets. To get more engagement from local communities in conservation works, we formed local conservation groups in 2018 and we gave, we gave them biowashing training and donated binocular in each village. These villages around Nanda Islands are always facing with their lack of fresh water difficulties during dry season. So we provided them by digging wells. At that time, we've already submitted the Nanda Islands and Mayu estuary to be proposed as flywheel water site in Myanmar. Now you can see what the successful story of engagement and empowerment of local communities for shorebird conservation in Myanmar. We made boundary demarcation and had consultation workshop with different stakeholders, including relevant government agency, university, NGO, INGO, local communities, and local conservation groups to be proposed in Nanda Islands as rural area and also rental site. From this workshop, we got agreement from all participants to be proposed in Nanda Islands, both the protected area and rest site. 
In November 2018, the area of 3608 hectares on the islands and Mayu estuary was designated as the fourth flyway north side in Myanmar, and then we installed the awareness symbol in Nanda Island. In October 2019, this sign was proposed as a marine national park. This is one kind of protected area in Myanmar. Uh, we, uh, for, for proposed protected area, we already submitted the area of protected area with the same boundary of line with our side. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation extended three nautical mines for protected area. In these two photos, uh, the red boundary of the first photo is the flywheel on our side boundary, and the second photo is the boundary of protected area. Uh, finally, in May 2020, this sign was designated as Francis site in Myanmar. Uh, well, i like to conclude my presentation uh, with the participation of our local partner, Avenka, and local communities. The, we call achievement achievement in conservation in Nanda Island. So now i like to start my sharing screen. Thank you all for your listening. It was a pleasure being here today. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and uh, congratulations on the great work on Nanta Island. That's truly amazing. So we now have time for a few questions before we, uh, we go more to the closing session. So I'll just click on the Q&A. Meanwhile, do keep them coming. So like I said, Chris is quite popular. Uh, I'm just going to put one question to Chris. Uh, Chris, can you say what the roofs are like in bad weather? Have you looked at the durability of it and, and how they behave in bad weather? Yep, no worries. So the, uh, the roofs are obviously built based on the oyster bag. So in oyster aquaculture, they're uh, looking to grow oysters in all sorts of conditions and including high energy coastline. So these things have been up in Canada, off the coast of Canada in you know, three, four metre swells. Uh, we don't have that at any of the sites that we're looking at. But they're anchored on, and I, we got this out of the garage. This is one of the uh, screw anchors. It's a galvanised screw anchor. You work that into the mud. If you ever put your, your foot in the mud, you know, you can, you can get your foot stuck in there. This thing can take four tonnes of, of strain on it. So that's tied off onto, a, um, onto a, what we know as a storm line, and it's aptly, um, aptly named. And then onto the storm line, you clip what's known as shark clips. So all very tough things, storms, sharks, it can, it, they can take anything. Now, they are made at the moment out of high density um, polyethylene um, plastic, which is UV stabilised. So the guys who invented these wanted them to last long and they didn't want to lose their oysters. So they made them so they don't degrade in, in salt water. So what's good for them is good for us, but there is always um, the chance that they will rub up against each other. We're leaving them in the water for a long time. So they, we're promoting barnacles and things to grow on them. So they rub against each other. Um, so they might release microplastics. So that's why we've got um, the designers and postgrad students and research and development from RMIT looking at other options like kelp, um, like uh, local pandanus, uh, algae, um, and uh, some in really interesting fungus options. So. Uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, non-plastic prototypes to go in the water by uh, 2022. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. So a, a quick question for Ayuwat. Um, so um, somebody, Doug, is interested to know what the salt producers think of bird droppings in the salt. Do they regard them as contamination? Yeah, uh, very interestingly, I get this question a lot. Um, from foreigners, <laughs> but not so much from Thai people. <laughs> um, well, actually, they don't care <laughs> at all about the birds dropping. So, yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, and um, I see another uh, question from Arn, uh, which I think is very interesting, um, asking about how do we um, avoid salt pans in Bakhale from being converted into mangroves, uh, which might sound um, 
weird for you <laughs> that we are um, conservation NGO, but we are also fighting against mangrove plantation, um, especially in Thailand, because um, yeah, believe it or not, it's, uh, it's, it has become quite a big business in Thailand, especially when um, big businesses are more interested in uh, CSR and they want to make good for the environment. So um, the mangrove planta planting, uh, so planting mangrove has become quite a um, very popular activity in Thailand. So um, even in the DMCR area, um, it was first, um, uh, it was first planned to be covered all with mangroves, but um, so we had to go through quite um, a long series of meetings with them, trying to make them understand the importance of having variety of habitats along the shoreline. So in the end, they, they, they finally um, understand and um, become supportive of our work and, and let some of that area uh, become like open, open mud flat. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Excellent, thank you. So um, there's still a few questions of the actually compliments coming in for Bangka for their work on Nanta. And there's an offer from somebody who is asking how they can contribute with binoculars uh, to the work of Bangka. So uh, we'll pass this on to the ladies from Bangka. And um, now we move on to the closing ceremony, which is with Simon. Simon uh, is a designer and works with Tuba, and he has created something that you just must see. Over to you, Simon. Hi, everybody. I'm Simon. I'm from Tuba, and the team behind Fly Away, uh, this board game that we developed with BirdLife International Asia as our partner. It revolves around bird migration and conservation. Uh, I've learned so much from all of the speakers today. I'm not an expert in this area, but what we like to do with this board game is to use it as a conversation starter for people to learn about uh, some of these issues. And perhaps along the way, they'll probe deeper into some of the issues the other panelists have spoken about. Uh, I've worked very closely with Ding Li to make sure that as fun as this game is, uh, people get to appreciate uh, a, a lot of these issues around bird conservation. And the great thing about board game medium is that you get to bring different communities together. So, you know, board gamers, of course, and nature lovers and, you know, families and students. So uh, I'm not going to run into great detail about the specific game mechanics, uh, but just the broad thematic concerns. So uh, in this game, you play as bird conservationist and you're trying to get as many points as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to save as many birds as possible. So here we have the different bird, uh, birds from different habitats. So there's an open country bird, there's a forest bird, and then here's the water bird. This is of course a spoonbill sandpiper that Siam and Ayuat spoke about. And uh, so in, uh, with all of these bird cards, there are different informational and educational touch points. So uh, one of these is the conservation status of each bird. So here it's critically endangered, and this is related to gameplay in that uh, the, the more endangered a bird is, the higher its value. So when you save this bird, you get 15 points. Uh, then the other aspect of uh, this is uh, of the information you get in a bird card is the start and end points. So this represents the start and end point for the bird's migration journey. Uh, so with this, we can move on to the map. So this game is set in the East Asian Australasian Flyway. This is a close up of one of the areas. So players will be placing links uh, to complete the migratory routes for different birds. And what we like to do with this is to uh, show it in a, a visual way the drama of bird migration. So uh, as all of you would know, you know, birds are facing a lot of these different dangers. So these red cards are called foul play cards. So, you know, they have they are natural and man-made dangers. But at the same time, uh, we also want players to know that there are things you can do to counteract this. So the green cards are called winged cards. So, uh, you know, in keeping the uh, theme of this conference, right, you want players to know that there are positive stories. So, you know, there are birders who make a difference. You work with governments to instill change. And perhaps in the future edition of this game, we can include an oyster bag that Chris was talking about. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, the broad 
uh, gameplay and themes of the game. Uh, there's a lot more to the game. Uh, you know, if you'd like to, please uh, uh, sign up for updates. You can go to our website uh, and also follow us on our social media. There's also a trailer where you can see the story we are trying to tell. Uh, with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share this game. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Simon. That's excellent. It looks great. Um, I propose that uh, Ting Li uh, post the link to the trailer in the, in the chat so we can share. Um, and then uh, Sounds we good. Okay, and now we move over to actually it's Ting Li himself who's going to do a pitch. So what do you want to tell us, Ting Li? I know that a lot of um, folks on the webinar are, are bird watchers and um, and are out there right now during the migratory season to look out for you know shorebirds and all kinds of waterbirds. So I thought this was a, a, a great opportunity. We've got, I mean, hundreds of people on the call right now. It's a great opportunity for, for us to share with them that we've got this exciting campaign going on. We've got the Lake Flag Challenge uh, photo competition. Uh, basically, what you need to do is really simple. Just go out into the field, get to the mud flats, get to the swamps, bring your camera and while you're looking at all these water birds look out closely for tags and flags on the bodies of uh, of our water birds now you you may be asking why should we do this you know what what's the purpose of having these tags let me just briefly explain to you why these tags are important to us so a lot of um things we do to conserve migratory birds come from how much we understand about the biology and the ecology of migratory birds and not uh, a lot of us are aware of the fact that we actually learned a huge amount about the life history of our migratory birds through the kinds of tags and flags that are attached to the bodies. Basically, biologists out there uh, put these uh, attachments to the bodies, and when they are able to relocate these birds, they are able to make some conclusions about where the birds are migrating to and what kinds of habitats are these birds using so that eventually we can use these same information to develop conservation plans for them. So really, the flags are very important in supporting conservation work and I thought this was a really good opportunity for us to get citizen scientists out there, bird watchers, bird photographers to go out there, look for these flags, look for these tags, take a nice photograph of them, send it in to us um, at the links that you have here and you may even stand to win some really, really exciting prizes, uh, including, if I'm not wrong, a brand new Swarovski binocular. So watch out for more information about the Lake Flag campaign. Um, uh, I think we've got a link actually on the previous slide. I'm just going to backtrack uh, a bit. Um, there is this URL you can go right to to submit your photographs of birds with a lake flag. And, and for those of us tomorrow, uh, if you have time in the evening uh, or afternoon or late evening uh, and want to know a little bit more about the science and the ecology, the lessons in ecology and conservation that we can learn from these lake flags, please join us at our next webinar, uh, which is uh, a webinar that will tell you what exactly happens on the ground. How do we tag these birds uh, and how can we get information from them that eventually goes to the science and then eventually informs the conservation. We've got three really expert speakers joining our panel tomorrow. So uh, if you want to hear the stories and learn from their experiences on the ground, join us tomorrow. You can register by scanning the QR code at the bottom uh, right of this slide. So um, that's really all from me. Um, I'll now pass the floor back to Baron, who will tell you about another exciting initiative coming out um, in a week from now. Over to you, Baron. Thank you very much, Dingley. I propose that you put the, uh, the, the Simon link and the links to the Leg Flag photo contest and for the webinar organized or actually hosted by the EAFP Secretariat uh, on, the, on the chat function for all the attendants so they have it at their fingertips. Sounds um, good. So for me, I also have to make a pitch. I'm sorry for that, but I'm now going to share my screen. Okay, so there's another um, webinar coming up. It's a global webinar. It's very much, it's not like this one, but it takes a bit broader view. It shows successes of conservation of micro, migratory birds in all flyways of the world. So if you have enjoyed this series of talk, there are more talks, but also including presentations from the Americas, from the African Eurasian flyway, and again, from the East Asian Australasian flyway.
So that sort of is a talk. It will be done on um, uh, the 14th of October. I will share the link uh, with you in the chat in a, in a second. Okay, and the other thing I want to draw your attention to, I hope you're seeing my next slide. Uh, can somebody confirm? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're celebrating uh, the, the, the wonder of bird migration all around the World Migratory Bird Day, but actually there are many other events that are sort of aligned in the same season. A new one is the Global Bird Weekend. It will happen not this weekend, but next weekend. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's an event where we try to have so many people to, as many as possible people to go out birding and record the birds they, uh, they see. When they submit their lists, their observations to eBird, we will hopefully get the maximum, as much as possible, the world record of numbers of birds seen in a single weekend. Okay, you can join the Global Bird World Weekend as an individual, or you can join as a team. Um, I'll share the link exactly on how it works. The good thing is you can win prizes, among them Swarovski Optics, who are a partner in this, and uh, there's also a rock jumper, rock jumper holiday on offer. So uh, if you enter, it doesn't depend on how many birds you see, but if, if you enter, you enter the draw for these prizes. So join the Global Bird Weekend, be part of the international biggest celebration for migratory birds, and have some good time birding. Um, that's it for me. I think uh, it's impressive how we managed to pack so many great stories in the two hours we had. I, I'm really impressed and thankful for everyone who has contributed. It's so great to hear about these stories that do make a difference and not just about the doom and gloom and the worries we're having. There's so much initiative around. There's from all levels in society, people are making an effort to save migratory birds, to enjoy migratory birds, find novel ways to protect them, and the, all that appreciation is very worthwhile. So I think this webinar was, in all modesty, I think a great way to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day, uh, which will start tomorrow. There are plenty of other things to do. Have a look at the World Migratory Bird Day um, website if you're looking for more events. And as Ding Li already said, the EEFB, they're hosting a beautiful um, webinar tomorrow. So if you want to be on the day itself to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day, Doug is the one you have to see. Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we had a good turnout. I think we had excellent talks and um, I think we all need to uh, applaud us for this. So thank you. And especially, of course, the presenters and all the people doing all the hard work in the field. Thank you so much for joining and uh, hope to see you soon.